Okay, it's a couple minutes after five, uh, so why don't we get started? Uh, I'm Whitney Tilson. Uh, welcome and uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we're going to be uh, giving a brief overview of the day long seminar that we do uh, called an advanced seminar on short selling. Uh, and this is one module uh, that will go through a portion of it, uh, sort of the core module that we teach that day called Lessons from 15 Years of Short Selling. Um, our agenda uh, for, uh, for um, this webinar is uh, to just start out. Glenn and I are each going to introduce ourselves, um, briefly give an overview of case learning. Um, and by the way, all the slides we'll be presenting today will send to you afterward. So, uh, so don't worry about taking notes or screenshots or whatever. Uh, we'll uh, send it to you along with uh, the video of this webinar, uh, both to anyone who attended, but also anyone who registered and wasn't able to attend uh, can watch the video afterwards. So uh, then we're gonna go through um, various, an overview of our experience with short selling uh, and sort of dive into at least some of the weeds um, uh, about what kinds of shorts have worked for us, uh, give a bunch of uh, case studies um, and uh, some tips and uh, um, stock, uh, shorts to avoid um, that we found and uh, sort of some of what we call lessons from the trenches. So uh, with that, let me uh, briefly introduce myself, then I'll turn the webcam over to Glenn uh, for him to introduce himself um, and we'll go from there. Uh, so um, uh, here's some pictures uh, from uh, the early part of my life. Uh, my parents met married in the Peace Corps. Uh, I grew up in Tanzania, Nicaragua. Um, uh, the picture in the upper left is uh, uh, me in school in Tanzania. I wanted to be a farmer like all of my classmates, uh, so there I am with my hoe. Uh, ended up uh, living uh, twice out at Stanford where my dad did graduate work, um, grew, uh, went, went to high school out in Western Mass at Northfield Mount Hermon School, uh, went to Harvard. Uh, coming out of there was one of the founders of Teach for America, worked a couple years at Boston Consulting Group, the only real job I've had in um, my 30 years post-college. Uh, post uh, other than that, it's been all entrepreneurial stuff. Um, went to Harvard Business School, spent five years working with Michael Porter thereafter, and um, uh, then uh, started my own fund almost 20 years ago on January 1st of 1999 and uh, managed that until uh, last fall. Uh, Glenn and I uh, managed it together for about half of that period. Uh, and now uh, I'm doing case learning. Um, in, in, in between in there, 25 years ago, met and married my wife, um, who was a student at Harvard Law School. Uh, and as you can see in the lower right-hand picture, we now have three daughters and the most beloved member of the family, Rosie the Wonder Dog. So uh, with that, let me turn it over to Glenn to introduce himself. Hi. Uh... You can see from this picture, I am a, uh, a proud dad of uh, five children. I grew up in uh, West Orange, New Jersey. Uh, did my undergraduate work at Princeton University. I got a degrees in uh, computer science and in electrical engineering. Uh, my planned business strat uh, work strategy was gonna be uh, working for my dad's company, Blonder Tongue Inc., which is a manufacturer of cable television equipment. Um, very, very early in the uh, cable TV days. Um, I got a Wharton MBA in, uh, in, in trying to further that career. Uh, that company was sold and I, I went to Wall Street. I, I went to work at uh, Donaldson Lufkin Chen Red. I was a managing director there uh, up through um, the late 90s um, and then went over to become the president of DLJ Direct, their online brokerage business, um, which uh, was one of the very early pioneers in uh, online electric trading. Um, after DLJ was sold and uh, DLJ Direct was sold, I went back into banking for two more years um, uh, at UBS. But in the, um, in the meantime, I had met Whitney uh, while I was the, uh, running the brokerage firm. And uh, we had a, uh, a very aligned interest in uh, how we looked at stocks, how we enjoyed investing, uh, how we liked the process. Um, and I joined up with Whitney and we worked together for eight years in the hedge fund. Um, I managed uh, money separately after that experience uh, until getting back together with Whitney and uh, we've been uh, working hard at uh, building uh, uh, case learning. Great, thanks Glenn. Um, let me give uh, everyone a quick overview of uh, case learning and then we'll dive into the topic of today. So um, it's uh, Glenn and I have been doing a lot of teaching over a lot of years so it's a very natural transition for us uh, when we uh, uh, stop managing money for other people to uh, to get into the teaching business. Uh, we've got 50 years combined experience between us in the finance and investment industries. 
Um, and we think there's real need for it. Um, in, in, investing is a battle all, always, but especially these days in a world dominated by index funds and uh, quant funds, uh, you got to be better than ever. And this is an experience-based business. Um, there are only two ways to get experiences. Is one is, is get it yourself the hard way, and the other is, is learn it from somebody else. We highly recommend the latter. Uh, if you're lucky enough to get a job uh, working at a great firm, uh, that's the best way to get experience. But um, if you're trying to sort of learn the business on your own and bootstrap it the way we did, um, you know, we're here to help. That's what we're trying to do with uh, case learning is help other people get up the experience curve quickly, um, replicate our successes, avoid our mistakes, stand on our shoulders and achieve even greater success. So. Uh, everything we teach is based in real world experiences. Uh, so we're not teaching any theory, no spreadsheets. Uh, it's all rooted in our own experiences, our observations of others' experiences, and real world case studies of investments that we've made over the years. Uh, we don't just uh, do victory laps on the things we did right, and we did a lot of things right and achieved a lot of success. Uh, but we also uh, spend almost as much time focusing on the mistakes we made, both on the investing side and on the business building side. Um, that uh, eventually cost us. Uh, you know, we are value investors, uh, but we uh, aren't uh, dogmatic uh, investors, and we've made money uh, over time in things like um, uh, Google, Facebook, and Netflix. Uh, so uh, we think value can exist in a lot of places, and we aim to teach that. Uh, we also teach entrepreneurship, not just investing. Our core program is a three-day uh, Lessons from the Trenches Investing Bootcamp, but we also have a one-day seminar on how to launch and build an investment fund and then the one day seminar that this webinar is rooted in, which is an advanced seminar on short selling. So um, it's, it's great if you're a good investor and that's the first thing you need uh, to go start your own fund or manage other people's money, uh, but it's only a starting point. Uh, there's a whole range of entrepreneurial skills you need um, and we teach that as well. So uh, we're now uh, going around the world with our three programs over five days. Uh, we're going to 10 cities in uh, less than a year uh, starting with London uh, a week and a half from now. Uh, we've got a, uh, we did a, a conference only on short selling, the first of its kind on May 3rd. We're doing it again, September 24th. Uh, and um, we, we uh, almost a decade into a bull, uh, long bull markets, we think there's no better time for a conference dedicated solely on short ideas. Um, so uh, let's, um, with that, uh, we'll send the slide presentation out. If you want further information, you can just go to caselearning.com. Um, so let's dive into uh, an overview. It's not the, the in-depth uh, piece that we do over two to three hours uh, on our day-long seminar, but we're gonna give you maybe a 20, 30 minute overview, um, and then happy to uh, talk about things during Q and A. Um, we, um, we may have a smaller group today, so maybe we should experiment um, with, um, you know, you can ask questions and you can start sending them to us as we're presenting here. Um, you don't have to wait until we're finished with uh, about 15 slides here. Um, uh, if, um, if you want to ask your question um, via typing it, just click the Q&A button or the chat button. We sort of prefer the Q&A button, but the chat button works as well. And just type your question. Uh, Glenn will be processing them um, and will field questions and ask them to me on your behalf. Uh, but if you want to ask a question, either um, either if you have a video stream or just the audio, uh, uh, go ahead and, and click the raise hand button and we will see that as well. And we have a small enough group uh, attending this webinar uh, that um, let's give that a try. Um, and uh, so, so you've got three ways to ask your question, uh, video, audio, or uh, via the Q&A, via typing it. Uh, so with that, uh, as background, um, let's, uh, let's dive in. So here's a very wordy slide, but just a summary. We were short sellers for the better part of two decades, very actively so, um, you know, ranging from a half dozen shorts to well over 50 short positions at any one time. Um, and we had some real epic highs, uh, nailing lumber liquidators, bringing that story to 60 minutes and exposing uh, what that company was doing, uh, poisoning its customers by selling uh, formaldehyde laden laminate flooring. Um, we nailed the housing bubble uh, and made a lot of money uh, shorting into the great recession. Uh, but overall, over the 15 plus years, uh, we were active short sellers, we lost money. Um, it is a brutally difficult thing, shorting is. Um, and especially during a long complacent bull market like this one, it's inflicted enormous pain on virtually all short sellers. I know a handful of people who have not gotten clobbered, but not many. 
so our advice to most investors is, is learn about short selling. There are a lot of important skills and lessons that any investor can benefit from, even if they're long only, but not actually do it. Um, that said, for some investors, um, it can make sense. Uh, some people can develop the expertise uh, and experience uh, to do it well and make money even during bull markets. Um, uh, I think it's a great time to be looking at short ideas uh, it, almost 10 years into this bull market with a lot of hype and complacency and, and certain pockets of fraud out there. Uh, can you say Bitcoin? Um, so it's a good time to be looking uh, for short ideas. Um, and lastly, uh, we think it's very healthy for our markets, uh, especially uh, in a long bull market like this, that there be active short sellers, uh, uh, not just people doing it, but going public with their short case um, and helping offset the incessant cheerleading of company managements uh, and their Wall Street um, lackeys. Uh, so, uh, so that's what we're trying to do uh, by teaching short selling and by hosting our conference on short selling. So um, let's talk about three types of shorts that we have a lot of experience with, but in general, we did not have a lot of success with. Um, number one, uh, just total frauds, the kind of pump and dump schemes uh, that you see uh, on Long Island boiler rooms in the, the movie, The Wolf of Wall Street, um, the movie, The China Hustle, an outstanding documentary I highly recommend exposes uh, a lot of the reverse merger uh, China frauds. A few hundred Chinese companies were taken public by very shady um, uh, lawyers, brokers, um, um, you know, stock firms uh, in the United States uh, in, the, uh, in the late 2000s. Um, and uh, you know, so that's you know, total frauds of stocks uh, worth zero. A second category would be just stocks in overhyped sectors. Uh, cryptocurrency would be a good example today. Some people would argue marijuana stocks in the past, uh, uh, alternative power stocks, 3D printing stocks. Um, uh, a third category is just market darlings. Real companies um, have, may, may have very happy customers, companies like Netflix and Tesla, where a lot of people have shorted them because they just think the stocks are way ahead of the fundamentals because investors, uh, particularly retail investors, have fallen in love, in love with them. Um, we've shorted dozens and dozens and dozens of stocks in all three of these categories. Um, and overall um, had a very mixed record at best. Uh, probably if you added it all up, a pretty unhappy record. And the reason is, is because even if you're right 70% of the time, and that's a pretty high batting average, um, the uh, 10 or 20% that you're wrong on can really go up a lot. Uh, anyone who is short Netflix, and by the way, it had a 30% short interest at the bottom um, uh, about six years ago, um, or Tesla, where I was short it from 35 to 205, uh, mostly in 2013. Um, you know, um, these, uh, these stocks, when they rip um, and when they become disconnected from traditional valuation metrics, um, there's almost no uh, uh, height to which they cannot go. And if you are short, you will get destroyed uh, by those 10 or 20% of cases. Um, so, uh, let's flip to the next slide and just talk about where we have had success. And it's really just two criteria. It's companies based on a multiple of earnings and then earnings go down a lot. Um, and that may sound sort of obvious, but if you just flip back to the previous slide and you look at those three categories of shorts, those are generally not stocks valued on a multiple of earnings. Um, uh, Tesla is certainly not valued uh, on a multiple of, of earnings and never has been. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so, so it's really pretty simple. Um, and uh, so the question is, is uh, let's take a look at, at a bunch of case studies related to this. So here's the key, um, coming up with a great short case and predicting that earnings are going to go down in the future um, is nice, but it's not what takes stocks down. What takes stocks down generally is an actual collapse in earnings. Um, and so sometimes uh, getting out ahead and predicting what's going to happen, sometimes one, two, three, four years out, um, if you're short that stock in the meantime, you can get killed. So here's an example, a very famous example of which there's a book actually, Confidence Game, um, about Bill Ackman's saga with MBIA. Um, and we were short the stock during this period. We did our own work and concluded that Bill was correct, that MBIA was dangerously over levered um, and that uh, would collapse at some point. The problem is, is Bill and we were five years too early. Um, 
the company uh, continued uh, to write uh, bad policies under reserve, but, the, but they were reporting super high profits in the meantime. And as you can see in this chart, the stock doubled before the hurricane finally hit in the Great Recession and MBI stock went from over 70 to under $3 a share. Uh, so let me give a bunch of other examples um, uh, of companies in which you can just see the stock price follows the earnings, uh, not the prediction of, of declining earnings, but the actual earnings. So here's Lumber Liquidators, one of uh, my, uh, uh, probably my best known uh, uh, activist short position over the years. And you can see the stock ran up enormously as something like a seven bagger in less than two years in 2011, 12, and 13. Um, and that was driven by skyrocketing earnings. And then sure enough, earnings uh, went way, way down, turned negative uh, for uh, 2015 and 16. And you can see that, um, that the stock went down by 90%. Um, here's 3D systems. Uh, it and Stratasys are the market leaders in uh, 3D printing companies. Um, and this was a wildly overhyped sector. Um, the, every stock in the sector uh, went up, you know, roughly 10x, uh, as you can see here. But in the case of 3D systems, they were actually growing their earnings. It's a real company. It was just trading at about 20 times revenues at the peak. Um, uh, and then the bubble burst. Uh, all sorts of competitors emerged in the sector. Um, 3D Systems was uh, a roll-up strategy, so they had difficulties with their roll-ups, took a lot of charges. As you can see, earnings went severely negative and have stayed negative uh, over the last few years. And as you can see, the stock went down by about 90% and has stayed down. So here's Bed Bath & Beyond, a classic value trap uh, that's being Amazoned. Um, and the earnings, it was a great great growth story for many, many years. And you can see earnings march steadily upward, the stock march steadily upward, and then the Amazon effect kicked in. And I know so many uh, uh, value investors on the long side who uh, got lured in. It looked cheap and it's looked cheap all the way down as earnings have declined, uh, so has the stock. Um, here's a, one of the most famous uh, uh, examples out there, Valiant. Uh, this uh, earnings, the stock went up something like 20X in six years. But by the way, earnings, uh, operating earnings went up 14X over that time period. So uh, this was uh, an earnings driven story. And then uh, all sorts of things happened that all of you are familiar with. Earnings collapsed, uh, still positive, uh, but you know, not, not clear whether there's gonna be any value left after the huge pile of debt they took on. And as you can see, uh, stock has, has collapsed and has pretty much stayed down. It's uh, bounced a, a bit off its lows for very clever bottom fishers. Uh, but generally speaking, you can see how closely the stock has followed the actual earnings. Um, here's another example of Crocs. Um, it's had a couple ups and downs. Um, the little rubber shoes that are sort of faddish. Uh, and you can see back in, uh, you know, uh, a dozen years ago or so, the fad took off. Stock went from 10 to over 70. Uh, as earnings uh, went up almost tenfold. Uh, then the fad burst and the company almost went under. Um, it, the stock went from over 70 to a buck a share. Uh, but believe it or not, the company survived, earnings recovered, and the stock went from a, a buck to 30 bucks uh, as earnings recovered. And now earnings have tapered off, the stock has tapered off, and now there's been another uh, sort of double in the last year or so as earnings have picked up again. So. Uh, this is an example of over a long period of time. You could have made good money here on the long and the short size um, by following the earnings and predicting what was going to happen and when there were going to be inversions on the earnings. So the question is, is so now I've given you lots of examples and told you the best shorts out there are stocks valued on a multiple of earnings and the earnings collapse. So the question therefore is, is okay, uh, how do I find collapsing earnings stories? Um, and there are a lot of different things that can cause companies' earnings to collapse. So let's start with unsustainable or illegal business practices. Um, obviously, lumber liquidators um, uh, sourcing a bad product in China when that was exposed uh, crushed the company. Uh, Valiant making endless acquisitions and then jacking prices through the roof um, uh, are a couple examples there. Uh, a business model that's just become obsolete, um, often by technology. Uh, look at all the retailers from uh, Bed Bath & Beyond to Staples to Barnes & Noble. Netflix's DVD by mail business um, uh, uh, got crushed. Uh, Barnes & uh, excuse me, Blockbuster, um, paging companies, newspapers, um, you know, companies uh, that are just, it's very, almost impossible to make money no matter how cheap you buy them if earnings just go down steadily. And in fact, uh, you, that's where you should be looking for shorts. 
Um, obviously, accounting frauds, uh, if you can uncover the accounting fraud, like Enron and WorldCom, uh, those tend to um, uh, uh, crush earnings uh, and stocks. Um, companies with legal or regulatory scrutiny. Um, we've already talked about Lumber Liquidators and Valiant. Um, another company, Insys Therapeutics. Uh, I can't believe how long it took regulators to act on the fact that Insys was marketing an incredibly toxic uh, opiate drug um, to uh, people who should not have been taking it. Um, and this uh, unfortunately went on for years, but finally regulators cracked down and the stock got crushed. Um, number five, a wave of new competition. So we already talked about how 3D systems got crushed by uh, lots of new competitors entering the market. And uh, those who are short Tesla today certainly believe that it's um, going to get walloped uh, as nearly every major automaker in the world rolls out some pretty incredible uh, new electric cars uh, that are, have been on the drawing board for a couple years and are now about to hit the market. Uh, number six is the aftermath of one-time events. Um, for example, uh, uh, there were hurricanes uh, in 2012 that uh, led to a lot of people uh, buying um, lumber liquidators products. There was a big surge, and that's one of the things that fueled um, the stock's rise. It wasn't just sourcing in China, so that was another way to win on the short side as uh, the company anniversary uh, that uh, one-time surge in sales. Um, uh, more broadly than just a one-time surge like a hurricane is just a cyclical company over-earning at the peak of the cycle. And interestingly, that's when the stocks often look the cheapest. They're trading at the lowest PE multiple. Uh, but if you can uh, accurately identify uh, companies uh, where there's a one-time uh, event uh, or, or an industry cycle, and, and you can pick that cycle, uh, you can often uh, make a lot of money shorting the reversion to the mean there. Um, and lastly, uh, fads coming to an end. Uh, Crocs is one example I already discussed. Um, Heelys, those, those shoes that had wheels embedded in them. There are all sorts of fads that come along where uh, stocks go through the roof and you could short the uh, ending of the fad. So um, let me um, point out something though, is, is it pays to be smart in the market. It pays to do incredible work and it pays to uh, be able to accurately predict the future. Just a word of caution here though, um, to repeat what I said uh, a little bit earlier, which is if you are too smart and you predict that a company's uh, business and it, therefore its earnings are going to collapse, but you're wrong on the timing um, and it doesn't happen for a couple of years. And in the meantime, the company continues to put up good numbers. In all likelihood, that stock's gonna keep going up. And I can't tell you how irritating it is uh, to have figured out that something was completely unsustainable, um, that the cycle was going to turn, uh, that a company was dangerously under levered, uh, be uh, put on a short position, and then uh, have uh, just take pain as the stock ran up and up as the bad things I predicted didn't happen, at least not immediately. In most cases, I was right in the long term, uh, but I should have been more patient. And waiting uh, until uh, there's, there's sort of clear evidence that, that when something is going to happen, not just the if it's going to happen, uh, is important. So in that sense, uh, shorting is, I feel, a little harder, quite a bit harder on the long side, in that um, on the long side, if, you, if you're not sure, if you, if you know it's cheap, you know good things are, happen, uh, are going to happen, but you're not sure when, fine, just wait it out. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes you own a stock for a year or two before it doubles, right? And then you still made a double and you're still good. On the short side, it's just, it's just more dangerous. Um, I, I've seen stocks double, triple or more against me and other investors while they're waiting for the catalyst uh, and for the investment thesis to work out. So on the short side, one of the reasons it's a lot harder is, is you need to be more focused on the timing and on potential catalysts. So, uh, let me just show some examples, and these are these are a, a few of well over a dozen tips uh, uh, that that we teach during our day long seminar. So one is just a word of caution about avoiding valuation shorts. Um, if a company is is genuinely cranking, its business is genuinely doing well, uh, it's growing customers and revenues at a high rate. Um, in all likelihood, that stock is going to keep going up. So look at these stock charts of companies that are just amazing companies. Um, and I was foolish enough to be short Netflix at one point, uh, fortunately turned around and went long it. Foolish enough to be short uh, Salesforce uh, at one point, just because I thought it was trading at an unsustainable valuation and they weren't actually making any profits on a gap basis. 
Uh, fortunately, it was never sh foolish enough to be short of Amazon or Facebook, but I know people who have been. Uh, so, so don't get into gr uh, growth stories um, uh, unless you're really sure that that growth story is going to crack. Um, and don't get in just on valuation. Um, uh, if a company keeps putting up great numbers, uh, that stock's going up. I don't care what the valuation is. So in particular, never, ever, ever short accelerating growth, meaning that it's not just a high growth rate, but the, gr the rate of growth is accelerating. It's a second der derivative here. So take a look at Netflix and what happened. It's always had positive year over year growth every single quarter going back uh, more than a decade. Um, but you notice during the Quickster debacle, when the stock went from over 300 down to as low as 50 uh, pre-split, pre a seven for one split. Um, uh, and then look at what's happened to the quarterly growth rate every single quarter since then. And it's, it's really astonishing that a company, it, its growth rate was you know, in the teens, then it was in the 20s for two or three years, and now it's accelerated up north of 40% year over year revenue growth. Um, I don't care what Netflix's valuation is, you do not wanna be short an accelerating growth story like this unless you are absolutely certain that, uh, that that growth is gonna crack, and not just a little bit, but a lot. So don't short companies with insanely happy and loyal customers. Um, uh, uh, good examples of this would be Netflix, Starbucks, Green Mountain Coffee, Lululemon, Costco, uh, Southwest Airlines. Uh, <clears throat> I can tell you Green Mountain Coffee was a real frustrating one. Um, I, I knew they were committing inventory fraud, they were, uh, but you know what, it didn't matter. David Einhorn exposed it and it really didn't matter. Uh, they were producing a product that customers really loved, uh, that was a very lucrative business. Um, they eventually got bought at a, at a very nice price and, um, uh, and it was easy to get hung up on, you know, it sounds, sounds sort of funny to say a little bit of inventory fraud, but it turns out it just didn't matter. Um, you know, people have been, uh, I've seen short sellers and the short case on Netflix for years is, is that their long tail liabilities for the content contracts that they're signing uh, aren't properly accounted for on the balance sheet. And you know what, it just doesn't matter uh, when uh, customers love them and they're growing like wildfire, especially uh, uh, internationally. Uh, so look, companies that have insanely uh, happy and loyal customers have, it just gives them enormous advantages. Uh, it gives them pricing power. Most importantly, Netflix over the past few years, every year or two, it just raises their price by a dollar a month. When I was um, back there short it and then we were long it, um, it was $7.99 a month. Um, now we're paying $11 or $12.99 a month. Um, so uh, it gives them free word of mouth advertising, which reduces their marketing expenditures. Um, so the most vivid example I would give in recent years is Tesla. It's got everything short sellers look for, um, and it lured me in, um, and, uh, but it's pretty much destroyed everybody who's ever shorted it. Um, and in hindsight, you know, I knew, every person I knew who owned a Tesla loved it. Uh, Glenn owns a Tesla, and he can tell you how much he loves it. He was just raving about it today to me. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, it just gives Tesla a, a lot of levers to pull uh, when they're making a, a great product. Now, uh, I think Tesla just in the past month or two uh, has possibly become a short. Maybe we can discuss that uh, in the Q&A. Uh, but I've been warning all my friends since I got destroyed and got out. This is a bad short. Um, uh, and again, during the Q&A, maybe we can talk about, uh, uh, you know, why it might why I'm, I have a more moderate view. I'm not sure it's a good short, but I'm no longer telling people they're crazy to be shorted. So don't use options. Um, you know, many investors think that they're mitigating risk by using uh, buying put options instead of being short a stock because then they've reversed the bad math. They can only lose the amount of their investment uh, and their upside is uh, potentially unlimited, just like a long. This is true, but the problem is, is you now have to be right on the stock and the timing. And as I pointed out, the timing can be super, super hard. It's, it's so hard just to be right on a stock to then layer in uh, being right on the timing. Uh, my view is, is it's just too hard. Um, something like uh, I've heard that the vast majority of options expire worthless. Um, and uh, so, you know, my view of mitigating risk is buying an instrument where your most likely outcome is a zero doesn't, doesn't strike me as uh, mitigating much risk. So uh, I'll, I'll leave you with uh, some wise words uh, a friend of mine um, told me uh, in referring to options, using them either long or short. And he said, they feel so good. They're like heroin. 
They feel so good, but they will kill you. Uh, so don't use options is my uh, simple advice. Um, lastly, I'll just highlight uh, a four-part series uh, that I wrote on Seeking Alpha. Um, I'll send this uh, in the slide deck. You can click these links um, with a lot more uh, details. Uh, and um, uh, so let me finish with some conclusions, then we'll open it up to Q&A. Uh, either use the raise hand button if you want us to call on you, or just click Q&A and type your questions, and Glenn will, uh, will curate and read them. So uh, number one, just remember shorting is really, really difficult. Um, you got to size position small, aggressively manage risk, um, and don't get lured into the shorting the story stocks and the boiler room stocks and all of that. Keep it simple. Uh, focus only on stocks that are valued on a multiple of earnings where you've done real in-depth due diligence and you believe that earnings are going to go down, not a little, a lot, and soon. Uh, so look for multiple ways to win though. Uh, companies or industries in secular decline, a fad coming to an end, leverage or financial distress, uh, the market underreacting to new news like an earnings miss or a guide down, uh, impact of new competitors, regulatory problems, uh, very high valuation far above historical norms. Again, never short just on valuation, but it's a nice to have as part as one way to win and look for unsustainably high margins as well. Um, you know, in my most successful short ever lumber liquidators, I had virtually all of those uh, working in my favor. Um, and be patient. Don't try and be a hero and short a stock and try and nail the exact top. Um, too often you're getting in on the rocket ride up and you get killed on the way up. Instead, be a little patient. Um, generally speaking, uh, when a stock, if you're right on the fundamentals and a stock is dropping from 100 to 10 like 3D systems, you don't have to short it at 100. You, didn't, you don't even have to short it at 70, uh, or 90, 80, or 70 on the way down. Um, you know, by um, the, it reached when it was trading at 20 times revenues. Even when the stock fell 25% and is down at 75 bucks, and it's clear the wheels have fallen off the bus, you're still shorting it at 15 times revenues. And now you can see uh, that, that uh, the unfolding um, collapse in, in the company's earnings. Um, and just short it all the way down. Um, one last thing uh, I'll, I'll leave you with, in addition to don't use options, uh, is uh, think about balancing your long and your short book. Um, I've seen a lot of value guys be long a portfolio of things like Berkshire Hathaway and Apple and sort of big cap, just nice safe stocks. And then they're short uh, boiler room stocks and Teslas and, and you know super high vol stuff. Um, because that's the kind of stuff value guys are, are, are drawn to. Um, and the danger there is, is that there can be extended periods in the market where value just doesn't work um, and your long book is, is doing very poorly. And then on top of that, during that same time period, um, there's a lot of hype and fraud in the markets. Uh, and so your short book is ripping against you. And that double whammy leads can lead to years where the stock market is up 10 or 20 percent and you're down 10 or 20 percent and effectively you have a year like that and you're out of business um so uh so again if you're you know uh, when when i was short things uh something like tesla i was also long netflix um tend to be owned by a lot of the same kind of investors um and while tesla really hurt me in 2013 uh tesla netflix uh really bailed me out um, and so, um, so, you know, when I was short some of these high vol stuff, I was also long some things, you know, like SodaStream or Deckers, um, you know, some more smaller cap high vol sto st stocks that I sized on the smaller side in my long book. Uh, but that was, you know, that was deliberate given I knew that I had a pretty high vol uh, short, short book. So with that, uh, let me uh, um, turn it over to Glenn um, and anyone who wants to uh, raise their hand uh, and ask their questions directly to us, feel free to do so. And in the meantime, I'll just go back to the cover page and, uh, um, and I'll switch the camera over to uh, Glenn or me. Uh, so Glenn, do you want to uh, uh, go ahead yes. with... Uh, uh, just first off with housekeeping, uh, will yesterday's presentation be made available for those that did not see it? Yes, and we will make this uh, presentation available. Um, um, we'll send it to everyone who registered for this call, um, and then we'll post it on the web, and uh, I'll post links to it on our Facebook, LinkedIn, and uh, Twitter accounts as well. Exactly what I did yesterday um, was all posted, both the video and the slides uh, were posted by this morning. So uh, hopefully by tomorrow morning, uh, if my video guy gets onto it, uh, 
uh, we'll have um, we'll make this uh, all available. Okay, so so in, in the context of today's presentation, um, we were asked: Is shorting a stock? the analysis of that different from the analysis associated with a long investment. Um, and along those lines, do you do, do you need to have different sources, including invest in investigation firms? Yeah. Um, so uh, the answer is, is I'd say it's sort of 80% the same. The foundations are the same on the long side. You're looking for um, uh, good companies uh, with strong competitive moats, uh, uh, with uh, producing a lot of cash flow with clean balance sheets uh, and a great management team that's honest and treats shareholders well, all at a real low price. Um, on the short side, you're looking for the exact opposite, right? Uh, so you're looking for companies with uh, very poor competitive positions that are being eroded, uh, with um, uh, uh, very heavily indebted balance sheets, uh, ideally producing little or no uh, free cash flow, and that's really critical. Um, you know, companies very, very tough being short companies uh, like Herbalife, for example, uh, that are producing a lot of free cash flow. Uh, even if the business isn't doing so well, companies can take on debt, uh, um, uh, buy back a ton of stock. Um, Herbalife has run the stock, um, it, I wouldn't call it stock manipulation because it, uh, what they have done in terms of the stock isn't illegal. Uh, they've just bought back a ton of shares, dried up the float um, and squeezed the shorts. Um, so, uh, and obviously you're looking uh, for um, uh, dishonest, uh, highly promotional uh, management teams, all at a very high price, right? So you'd think shorting is just sort of the opposite of being long. Um, and in many ways it is, uh, but as I pointed out, shorting the exact opposite, which is companies not based on a multiple of earnings is actually pretty dangerous because then there's no valuation anchor. The stock can just rip against you indefinitely. Uh, so, um, uh, the other thing uh, um, I would point out is, is when a value stock year long gets cheap enough, something will happen. Someone will come in and buy the company. Uh, there, there is some market correcting mechanism that works in your favor. Um, if you're right about buying something super cheap on the long side, uh, there it really isn't much uh, market correcting uh, mechanism on the other side. Uh, you there, yes, the only market correcting mechanism is the short sellers out there. Uh, but the problem is, is, uh, uh, is that uh, often on the most uh, egregiously overvalued uh, stocks, uh, there's, uh, you can't get the borrower, the borrowing cost is prohibitive. Uh, so, uh, and also, as I pointed out during my presentation, it's just harder if you're, if you're not right on the timing. Uh, so, so it's, um, it's like, it's like the opposite of long investing, but quite a bit harder. And you have to be just more focused on managing risk and trading the portfolio more uh, to manage risk. Um, and you have to be just more focused on, uh, on a catalyst and getting the timing right. Um, Glenn, what was the second part of that question? Um, do you use different- Oh, research services and all. Do you, um, there are lots of short uh, research services out there, um, but I wouldn't say there are any more than there are on the long side. I've never done a count on either side. Um, in, in either case, if you can find a good service that uh, comes up with good ideas for you to chew on um, and or uh, uh, you know, expert network um, uh, services, that kind of thing, uh, if you can afford that, um, have soft dollars to pay for it, um, and uh, some, some of those services can be excellent and, and very much worth what you're paying for them. Um, well, this is an interesting question. What do you think of uh, Citron? And I guess you might want to expand that into what you think of some of the other more public uh, short sellers. Yeah, um, I know Andrew left personally. Um, uh, I think I've only met him once, though we've swapped a lot of emails over the years. Um, I think he's very smart, uh, has very good instincts. Um, and uh, I think our markets would be healthier if there were a hundred of them. Um, uh, I uh, would suggest always do your own research. He's not always right. Nobody is always right. Uh, and blindly following anybody, um, is, uh, long or short, is a recipe for disaster. Um, so, um, you know, his is, uh, you should also keep in mind that you know, he does good fundamental research and generally has insights, but he is generally not engaging in long-term campaigns here. I have no idea how, how short his holding period, his average holding period is, 
um, but you know he has a more trading oriented style and uh, you should just be aware uh, of that when uh, thinking about your holding period for um, if you're going to be in a position you know that, that he's in. So um, from a practical standpoint, how would you go about shorting a company that has no earnings, is selling nothing but a story, and that the general investing public is buying and you're quite confident that the story is not going to be realistic? Yeah, um, my first piece of advice is just don't short it. Um, if it's not valued on a multiple of earnings and, and you don't have conviction that those earnings are going way down, just stay away from those battleground stories, the story stocks, um, uh, which is separate, by the way. There are battleground stocks like an Herbalife or a Tesla, where there are lots of people public on both sides. And then they're just the story stocks um, and that are more being aimed on the message boards at individual investors, you know, generally under a billion dollars in market cap um, are the ones I'm talking about. Though some people, you know, would, would put Tesla and Netflix, for example, in the same category. Um, but I, I think about those a little differently. Uh, so um, so uh, I got drawn into dozens and dozens and dozens of stocks on the short side, just like what the questioner describes. Um, and uh, generally, uh, even though I knew it was just so clear that it was just a ridiculous overhyped company and that the stock was trading at a ridiculous valuation, um, you know, even though I think I was right, if you went back, I was right uh, the significant majority of the time, not 55%, but, you know, 85% of the time I was right. Um, so why don't I recommend that? Why didn't I have more success doing it? Uh, twofold. Number one is the 15% I was wrong um, were really painful. They didn't go up five or 10% against me, uh, but 50 to 200 to 500% against me. Um, and I tended to be pretty stubborn long and short when I thought I was right. So uh, I probably took too much pain. Um, uh, and secondly, even if you're right 85% of the time, but you're wrong on the timing, um, a stock doubles against you before it collapses. Uh, well, if it doubles against you, you got to probably cover 50% of your position just to manage position size and manage risk. So even when it does work and you're eventually proven correct, um, you've made little or no money. So uh, by, I'm gonna... by the way, Glenn, I know you're asking the questions here, but if you want to chime in and add uh, answers to anything uh, here, um, feel free. Well, it's, it's funny you mention that because that's what I was going to do with this question. <laughs> Uh, the question is, when Berkshire A and Berkshire B get out of sync, and for those um, uh, wondering, one share of Berkshire A equals 1,500 shares of Berkshire B. When they get out of sync, it's a good idea to go long the BRKB shares and short one share of BRKA to capture the spread. And the answer is, um, every once in a long, long while, there's enough of a spread that develops to make it worth your while. Um, uh, I, I remember um, many years ago, there was in excess of a 4% uh, spread between those. Today, the, the spreads between those two sorts of securities, it, it's very, very narrow. And uh, I, I don't think you can make much of a living uh, trying to arbitrage uh, the difference there. Um, the question is uh, expanded to, are there any other situations um, like that? There's, a, there's quite a few class A, class B share um, companies um, that, that trade. Um, some of them trade dramatically um, uh, out of sync, and that's because of the liquidity of one versus the other, or uh, potential rights that are so dramatically different between the share classes that it justifies a different uh, a different price, and those I wouldn't rec would not recommend um, trying to arbitrage the difference there either, because that difference um, it, it isn't isn't clearly defined in in all cases. So um, if there's a um, a superior class that has uh, not just um, voting but has access to other economic attributes. Um, it, it can get dangerous trying to uh, trying to play that arbitrage game. Um, so that was that was that one. The next question I wanted to send over to you, Whitney, is um, can you describe what happens during a short squeeze? 
Yeah, um, a short squeeze basically means um, when, uh, just keep in mind when, uh, let me step back for those of you who may not be super familiar with the technicals, uh, but when you short a stock, you have to get the borrow generally from your prime broker. Um, then you go out and sell the stock. And so you collect the cash and now you have an obligation to return that number of shares. Um, and obviously if the share price goes down, um, it costs you uh, less to buy it back and you pocket the difference. So if you short 10,000 shares of a stock at $10 a share, uh, you collect $100,000, um, then the stock goes down to $6 a share. You can buy back, so you've got $100,000 in your bank account, you can buy back the 10,000 shares now for $60,000 at $6 a share. Um, and you, uh, so 60,000 bucks goes back out of your bank account, you're left with 40,000, the position is closed out, you just made 40% uh, on your money. Right, so a short squeeze happens usually when a company announces uh, unexpected good news, um, and it causes uh, a stock to pop up. Um, and uh, generally, uh, what that means is for short sellers is the position is now moving against them. Their liability has increased. So let's say you've shorted stock at 10, and the company announces great earnings, um, and now the stock opens at 13 the next day. So there's a 30% gap uh, up. So now your 2% uh, short position is now 30% uh, bigger. Um, you've now got a 2.6% short position against you uh, uh, just because you're, you're, you now owe $130,000, not $100,000 to buy back the 10,000 shares you owe at $13, right? So here's the thing, every other, so now you have, uh, now you have a, a stock that you may realize, hey, I may have made a mistake. I was too early on this. Uh, the company just reported great earnings. Um, and by the way, I'm not comfortable holding a 2.6% position. That's getting uncomfortably large on the short side. So you know what? I'm going to cover maybe 2,000 shares of my 10,000 share position. So, um, and bring that position size back down to two, uh, back down to 2%. Uh, so, uh, in that case, uh, I need to go out into the market and I need to buy 2,000 shares. Now, the thing is, all the longs who love the earnings report are also out there buying it, but here's the worst part and where a short squeeze happens is, is every other short seller is doing the same math in their head, in the same equation, and so all the other short sellers are out there buying, let's say, 20% of their position. So, with a company that has a large short interest, um, and that's uh, and that's the way to think about that is as percentage of the float uh, of the free float of all the shares outstanding, what percent is uh, is sold short, and anytime you get above you know high single digit certainly into double digit percentages, the risk of a short squeeze goes up because if all those short sellers who let's say account for 20 or 30 percent of the float um, are all buying back the stock, um, that puts upward pressure on the stock because they're buying it. Um, and so, but here's the math. Let's say all the short sellers out there. So let's say the longs look at the earnings report and they are willing to pay $13 a share for that stock the next day, 30% higher. But now all the shorts managing and mitigating their risk are in there and they, their buying runs it up to $16 a share. Well, now the math is, is now the stocks run 60% against me. Now my 2% position is up to a 3.2% uh, position. Uh, and now I've got to go back, go out and buy another 2,000 shares uh, to get my position size back down to manage risk. Lather, rinse, repeat. Um, and you can see how this can create a vicious spiral upward of the stock fueled by um, both the short sellers buying back uh, the stock, trying to manage risk, but also there are a bunch of cynical longs who see what's going on and they pile in to squeeze the shorts. Um, and all of this, particularly of a relatively thinly traded stock where the short interest is very high, uh, can create what's called a short squeeze. And it's a temporary blow off of the stock to the upside um, in which, which is often driven uh, by shorts covering uh, that can be super, super painful. The most classic example of this was Portion BW um, back, what was it, 10 years ago or so, Glenn? Um, when there was a stub trade where investors were long Porsche and short VW to create a stub um, that was virtually certain mathematically to work. Um, but uh, Porsche uh, manipulated the stock, bought a bunch of options, secretly bought back a bunch of VW stock um, and created the mother of all short squeezes where the stock didn't open up 30% the next day. It opened up three or 400% the next day. And so anyone who thought they had a modestly sized one and a half percent position here, uh, which might be an appropriately sized position here that mathematically seems certain to work, 
Um, the next day, the stock opened up five times temporarily for a day. Volkswagen was the most valuable stock in the world by market cap. Um, and all the shorts had to cover. Um, and so, you know, the, the, you know, the, that short uh, had a seven and a half percent position on the open the next day, uh, had to cover back down uh, and took, uh, took off in a four or five percentage point loss to their funds returns for the year on one trade, uh, one modestly sized short position uh, with, with a manipulated stock. Um, and uh, you know, some of the short sellers end up filing lawsuits and guess what? The German courts were not very sympathetic to them. They never got anywhere. Uh, so that's uh, uh, a short squeeze in the extreme. So Whitney, is it smart to have a systematic approach when a position moves against you, um, partially covering or is it better to just blow out the position and reevaluate after time. Yeah, um, there's no there's no right uh, answer there. Um, I never use stop losses, um, uh, either long or short. Uh, but anytime a position moved against me, either long or short, uh, I would do a real careful reevaluation to figure out, you know, because most of the time the market's right. You have to be humble and recognize that the collective wisdom of the market is right the vast majority of the time. Uh, so if you get into something and it keeps moving against you, um, you need to start with the presumption that you're wrong and the market's right and you somehow miss something in your work. Um, so this happened to me in the case of Netflix, um, to Glenn and me together, we shorted Netflix at 80 bucks a share. Um, this was a seven for one split ago. Um, and it ran up to $180 a share and it was so painful. And we, you know, our, the investment thesis was very simple. The DVD by mail business was dying rapidly. And it wasn't clear that the, the Netflix's streaming business, um, which they weren't charging anything for at the time, uh, was going to get traction and they were competing against much bigger companies. And you know, how many uh, carriage makers can you name that became successful auto manufacturers, for example? Uh, not very many, it's very rare. So uh, we were betting that Netflix wasn't gonna be able to successfully make that transition in any kind of profitable way. Um, and um, so when the stock ran from 80 to 180, we did a real evaluation. We obviously should have done it by the time it ran to 100 or 120 before it well more than doubled against us. Uh, but eventually, you know, the actions we took is, as, as we wrote up our short thesis, we published it publicly. Uh, Reed Hastings, the CEO of Netflix responded. Uh, we ended up having a meeting with him. We ended up doing a survey monkey uh, that over 500 people responded to. And it turns out, uh, you know, one core part of our short thesis, which is that uh, customers were dissatisfied by the streaming service because they didn't have a lot of the big movies, um, uh, you know, Avatar, uh, you know, The Sound of Music, The Godfather, Shawshank Redemption. Um, you know, we thought people would be dissatisfied with the streaming service. And you know what? The surveys revealed to us that people were very happy uh, streaming uh, seven seasons of Desperate Housewives or Friday Night Lights. Uh, Netflix, uh, we realized, uh, uh, is, is less a movie distribution streaming platform than uh, serial television shows. Um, so um, the combination of all of those things, in particular, sitting down with Reed Hastings, persuaded us that we were wrong. And that's why we covered, not because it went a certain percentage against us, uh, but because um, you know, the pain caused us to do more research. We realized that some of our assumptions were wrong. And then we got out. And in fact, um, uh, ironically enough, a year and a half later, after the stock uh, first rose from 180 to 300, it then collapsed down well over, under $100. Uh, we had developed an appreciation for both Reed Hastings and the company, um, and we thought they were going to be a winner, and uh, we got in pretty darn close to the bottom and made five times our money off the bottom. A question about the, the business of short selling. How much scale does a manager need in order to collect a portion of the interest being earned on the proceeds from the short sale. And uh, a part B to that question is how sensitive is shorting in a rising in interest rate environment? Yeah, well, shorting in the good old days when short-term interest rates were 5%, let's say, um, you know, keep in mind when you short a stock, you that $100,000 of cash that you've generated from shorting 10,000 shares of a $10 stock, that's sitting in your bank account, your brokerage account, and earning interest. Uh, the problem is, is in recent years, short-term interest rates have been basically zero. So you used to get a nice uh, three, four, five percent annual tailwind from your short book, which helped helped offset two things. One is, is you got to pay the dividend of a stock that's paying dividends that you're short, and two is, is the the negative rebate, uh, the cost to borrow um, for 
which can sometimes be obscenely high. Now, I've seen negative rebates of north of 100% annualized, which means you, you, you can't short it for more than you know a quick trade in and out of earnings, for example. So um, it doesn't matter really what your scale is generally. Obviously, the mega funds uh, have the ability to negotiate a little bit higher interest rate on the cash. Uh, but um, you know, even the small folks are, are gonna get a little bit of interest, but it's not, uh, uh, it's, it's really quite insignificant. Um, was there a second portion of that question, Glenn, that I missed? The, 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 there was, but before we do that, just to, to, to amplify one point, is on these hard to borrow securities, um, it's, they are valuable. So if you are lending those securities out on the flip side of this, you can, um, you can negotiate pretty, pretty nice when Whitney said there's a hundred percent re, um, uh, cost of borrow fees, um, you can negotiate getting a part of that, um, a part of that yourself. Yeah. Um, Glenn makes a good point. Um, I do not suggest as a general rule going long, heavily shorted stocks, short sellers in order to survive have to be extremely smart. Much the average short seller is much smarter than the average long investor in, in my experience. Um, just cause far fewer people do it. Um, you generally have to be significantly more experienced, uh, um, uh, et cetera. So um, if you see a high short interest, one of the reasons to learn about shorting is, is that it will help you on the long side if you're ever considering going long a stock and you see a high short interest, um, it should be a trigger to go do a lot more work and figure out uh, what the short thesis is so that you're not investing in a value trap on the long side. Um, that said, um, you know, I invested in Netflix, we invested in Netflix at the bottom when it had a 30% short interest, uh, a 50 bagger ago. Um, so you just have to understand long or short, it's almost always going to be the case that someone smart, um, some well, uh, uh, well-known investor or a very reputable firm is on the opposite side of the trade. So you just gotta do your own work. Um, and, uh, but one of the nice things about being long a stock that has a high short interest and a high cost to borrow is, as Glenn points out, uh, you can uh, you can collect uh, at least a portion of that negative rebate. Your broker is probably going to collect most of it. Um, but uh, go but ahead, Glenn. I was going to say the second part of that question had to do with um, whether shorting um, is easier, harder, or more mathematically palatable in an in a rising interest rate environment. Yeah. Um, a rising interest rate environment just means you're getting paid more uh, for the cash that's uh, sitting uh, in your brokerage account. So that helps. Um, um, you know, we are right now in a rising interest rate environment and it means the, uh, it's primarily because the economy is strong and unemployment is low. So that generally is boosting corporate earnings. So in that sense, it's creating a headwind for short sellers. Uh, so, um, uh, so I guess the answer is, is it depends. I don't know, do you have anything more to add to that, Glenn? I, I don't think so. I think there's a there's a lot of cross currents there. Um, Whitney Whitney points out the positives. The negatives are that um, interest rates, uh, um, uh, in, increasing interest rates reduces discounted cash flow valuations. So um, it is uh, er, future earnings growth that you'll that will be seen um, because the economic strength will be offset by a higher discount rate. So it's, it's kind of hard to get between the two. Um, but specifically for short selling, I, I, I wouldn't say there's much of a difference um, yeah. that I would say as counterpointed with long, uh, with long investing. Yeah. By the way, Glenn, if I can add to the um, question a couple of questions ago where someone asked is, 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 do you recommend having a systematic approach if a position moves a certain percentage against you or costs you a certain amount of attribution? a systematic approach to either reduce it or blow it out if you're getting hurt on the short side. And I suppose you could ask the same question on the long side. Um, and I guess I'm more open to that idea on the short side because there's the risk of uh, unlimited losses. Um, and you know, generally my advice is, is don't have hard rules, but rather, um, uh, but, but rather just have a, a, a process, something that kicks in, that forces you to reevaluate the position, figure out if you're wrong. Um, you know, we should have had something like that, Glenn, in the case of Netflix, when it ran, out if it just runs five or 10% against you, but let's say somewhere between 25 and 50%, if a position runs that much against you, um, uh, not necessarily a hard and fast rule, um, though I could see that on the short side. Uh, I do know people 
who any short position moves against them by a certain percentage, again, let's say 25 to 50%, they immediately sell the position automatically uh, because it's just too hard, they find emotionally to accurately assess that situation, number one. And number two is, is they just wanna make sure they're not gonna just get continue to get blown out in a short squeeze. Um, and then they wait 30 days. And that, uh, that means that they realize the tax loss uh, and then they, they're open to getting back in at that point, um, wherever the stock is. Um, you know, so I could, um, you know, I, I would not recommend a hard and fast rule like that on the long side because too often, you know, you're buying a stock that's gone down. It gets a little cheaper. That's great. Maybe you buy a little bit more. Um, but on the short side, you know, given the higher risk, uh, generally the higher volatility in most of those positions, um, you know, I, I, I would, it would be interesting to go, go back and back test our 20 years of short selling and seeing if uh, sort of we had a policy, if anything moved against us by X percent, uh, that we would just uh, blow it out and revisit. Um, here's a little bit of a controversial question. Um, was Bill Ackman wrong shorting a Herbalife? Do you now believe that it is not a pyramid scheme? Um, I was short Herbalife uh, for almost the entire period that Bill was short Herbalife because I do think it, uh, a large percentage of the business is a pyramid scheme. I'm not as much, I guess, of an absolutist as Bill that the entire business is a pyramid scheme. And I, in fact, I think it's, they've been deviously clever uh, in, um, in having enough of a legitimate business uh, to avoid getting put out of business by the FTC, which by the way, came in, did a multi-year investigation of Herbalife and basically concluded nearly everything that Bill Ackman said about Herbalife was correct. Uh, but, um, but they didn't quite label it a pyramid scheme and it wasn't a pure pyramid scheme like something like Burn Lounge, uh, which just got uh, shut down overnight. Uh, that's, the, that's what Bill was hoping for. Um, and I never expected that to be the case. What I did expect is, is that the uh, scrutiny um, and uh, of Herbalife and regulators cracking down, though not putting them out of business, would cause them to lose the very profitable, um, scummiest part of the business, the pyramid scheme, uh, where they're just selling a false hope and a dream to people. Um, and that that would cause uh, profitability to decline, decline fairly substantially and steadily, not, not suddenly. Uh, over time, and in many ways, uh, Herbalife stock would uh, follow the for-profit colleges, for example, when the U.S. Department of Education started craft cracking down on their scummy practices. Um, it did not play out that way, um, and I'm still not 100% sure why. I think there are a couple reasons. Uh, number one is, is 80% of Herbalife's business is international. So um, that's a huge difference. Uh, regulators internationally haven't done anything really to rein in Herbalife. Um, even in China where, where any kind of multi-level marketing is illegal, um, uh, uh, Herbalife has managed to uh, evade that uh, falsely in my opinion, uh, but no one's cracked down on them yet. Um, a second reason is, is Herbalife uh, had some big investors uh, led by Carl Icahn who came in, uh, put money into the company, um, helped support the stock and um, um, a third reason is, is uh, Herbalife has continued to crank out a lot of free cash flow. Um, it, they, it has not been really strong or growing, but they started with a very clean balance sheet um, and they've maintained quite healthy free cash flow. Uh, uh, it's, it's a pretty good business, uh, sort of scamming a lot of your customers. Um, and they have used that free cash flow very cleverly and their clean balance sheet to take on a lot of debt, buy back a ton of stock and basically create almost like a slow moving short squeeze. Um, so even though the fundamentals of the business have, have not done particularly well, uh, the, the stock has been, uh, I won't say manipulated, but been managed very effectively upward. So it's a, it's a good cautionary tale, I think, of the dangers of shorting uh, a company that has a clean balance sheet, uh, uh, that has a lot of cash flow, um, and waiting for regulators to really take decisive action. Um, uh, that can often be a mug's game. It took years before regulators started cracking down on Insist uh, Therapeutics, on Valiant, uh, on uh, Malincrot. They never did crack, crack down on QuestCore, one of the most frustrating shorts of my career, that got bought by Malincrot, and then Malincrot doubled before it finally collapsed by 90%, which is what has finally happened. But uh, I was just years too early on it. Um, 
you know, regulators looked like they were going to do something about world acceptance, and they just never did. Uh, uh, another one of my most frustrating shorts in my career. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I think the market has spoken over a long enough period of time that I'm willing to say I was wrong on Herbalife. Um, uh, I was wrong that regulators would uh, would uh, would take super decisive action. They took sort of milk toast action. Um, and the company has been able to keep their earnings uh, and particularly earnings per share via heavy share repurchases um, in, in a way that um, that I did not expect. So uh, I think sort of uh, on the fundamental principles of the short thesis, uh, I think we're largely have been largely proven correct. But the only thing that matters is, is, is did you make money on the short side? And the answer is no. So uh, I'll say I was wrong. Are there times, excuse me, are there times when it makes sense to pay that 30 or 40% cost to borrow, or should those situations be avoided um, at all, in all scenarios? Yeah, um, not always. Uh, sometimes companies really on the verge of collapse, um, and uh, people, smart people who do the research um, can predict that. Um, and you can get in, but you can't pay a 30 or 40% cost to borrow for very long. Um, even if you're in for uh, you know three months, that's one fourth of a year. So that now you've paid 10% uh, out the door. Um, so so you got to be extra clever with the timing there. Um, and generally, those are the kind of stocks that have super high costs of borrows. Are the kind of stocks that I just generally suggest avoiding, which is they're not valued on a multiple of earnings. It's just a hype and a story and some emerging nascent technology. Um, a good example. Um, that uh, Aristides Capital um, uh, pitched Chris Brown at our shorting conference on May 3rd is Energos. Uh, the ticker is W-A-T-T. -T. Um, and it's, it's, it's supposed to be able, they're, they're supposedly have a technology that would enable you to charge your cell phone when the charger is, uh, a wireless charger is on the other side of the room, you know, 10 feet away. And just the laws of physics uh, uh, say that that can't happen. Um, so it's clearly a worthless uh, uh, stock, uh, but in the meantime, it's an 80% cost to borrow, uh, and the stock just keeps hanging in there. So um, you got to be super clear on the catalyst. And by the way, for some short sellers, they themselves are the catalyst. Um, you, if you have really nailed something, uh, either going public with the story yourself, um, as Chris Brown did uh, at our conference, it turns out the catalyst there didn't really work. The stock didn't respond. Uh, but when Andrew left, went after Valiant, uh, the stock dropped, I think, 40% in a day when he uh, uh, brought a lot of attention to Philidor. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, Andrew left of Citron, um, saw Madrangi at Carisdale, um, uh, Ben Axler at Spruce Point, uh, another uh, guy who spoke at our shorting conference, um, have developed uh, effective business models, effectively being their own catalyst. And of course, you don't ha necessarily have to do it yourself. You can feed the story um, to a journalist who will then do the research. And that's what I did in the case of uh, bringing the lumber liquidator story to 60 Minutes. It's obviously massively more effective uh, to have 60 Minutes breaking the story on national television than you know me pitching it at a conference. Um, so we, we we're asked, um, and I'll answer this, how do you short the S&P 500? Um, the very large broad-based indices are, are really quite easy to, to short with very little cost. Um, uh, the the S&P 500, you would be shorting the, the ticker SPY, um, you can request a borrow and you'll always get it. There are some um, uh, ETFs, uh, especially the levered ones, that are difficult to borrow or have very, very high cost to borrows. But uh, the S&P, uh, the Russell, um, the NASDAQ, they're, 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 they're quite easy. Um, any interesting stories about Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger regarding stock shorting? Yeah, um, I'll tell a funny story um, uh, about a conversation I had with Charlie Munger um, back 15 years ago, I think it was 2002. Um, uh, Bill Ackman and I, and, and I think David Einhorn was involved, maybe Guy Spear. Uh, we were short Farmer Mac and MBIA, two very politically powerful, well-connected companies. Um, and they had um, uh, fed a story about nefarious short sellers manipulating, engaged in market manipulation and you know, fraudulent activity. 
um, and they had fed it to a, a, a gullible reporter at the Wall Street Journal who ran the story. And this was very early in my career. I was only, I was managing less than $10 million and seeing my name being dragged through the gutter in the Wall Street Journal, uh, you know, I thought my life was over. Uh, and sure enough, the next day, uh, Elliot Spitzer's office um, and the SEC both sent me subpoenas asking for all my emails, my trading records. Um, and, you know, I had an issue. Do I need to disclose this to my investors? I know I didn't do anything wrong, uh, but um, it, it was really it was really a scary time. And uh, so I called up uh, 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 Buffett, who I had written a few times to. And, uh, you know, I didn't really know him. I don't even think I'd met him personally at that point. Uh, but um, he took the call. He was kind enough to take the call. And his advice was basically is, is Whitney, I'm sure you didn't do anything wrong. And assuming you didn't, uh, this too shall pass. Uh, don't worry about it. You know, I've had my name dragged through the mud in the media plenty of times. And he said, you know what, but I'll bet Charlie has some uh, uh, some interesting perspectives on this. Why don't you give him a call? And I said, Mr. Munger, does, you know, I've never talked to him. I don't know him. You know, does he even know who I am? Will, will he take my call? And uh, Buffett chuckled and said, oh, yeah, he knows who you are. He'll take your call. Just give him a call. So I did. And sure enough, he picked up the phone. And um, the first thing he said is, is he said, Whitney, you're at, there's no question in my mind that you and Bill and others are absolutely right about MBIA. And he said it in just this tone of voice. He said, the idea that anybody would ever think that that company is triple A is so ludicrous. And he almost shouted it into the phone. And I was feeling pretty good. Um, you know, the, the, my, one of my heroes, uh, Charlie Munger, just said, you know, he thinks we're right. Um, then he said, though, he said, you know, Whitney, I, I think what you and Bill and others are doing is healthy for our markets. But my advice to Whitney Tilson is, is don't do it. Because uh, the problem is, is if you go through life stepping on people's air hoses, they're going to hate you. Um, and, you know, life's just too short to have other people hating you, especially powerful people. Um, and so he then he said, you know, I had some experience uh, uh, short selling earlier in my career. And I remember I was short three stocks. And they all eventually worked, but a couple of them sort of doubled against me before they worked. And, um, uh, and he said, you know, I just decided it's just too much brain damage. I'm just not going to do this anymore. And then he paused and he sort of chuckled and he almost said to himself, he said, he said, you know what, but every young guy seems to have to learn this for himself. And he was, of course, uh, uh, he knew that I wasn't going to listen to him, that I was going to go out there and continue shorting stocks and crusading against companies like Farmer Mac and MBIA. Uh, so he tried to warn me. Um, and I was too young and foolish and full of myself and cocky and confident and thinking that, uh, you know, we'd identified a couple great stocks and they both ended up working eventually, by the way. Um, and but it took me another 15 years to realize that I was uh, it was not a particularly good use of time and that I was not uh, well positioned to succeed at it. In other words, uh, you know, to, to run a short book, you, you generally need to have a lot of positions um, um, because each position size can only be fairly small. Uh, so you generally need a team of analysts and we never built that team of analysts. So, you know, Glenn and I were out there uh, running a normal size long book, but then uh, a double or triple that size short book. So maybe 20 stocks on the long side and 60 stocks on the short side. Um, and if you're a two-person operation, uh, um, you're not going to succeed uh, running, uh, trying to follow that many stocks. Um, so, uh, so um, you know, uh, let me summarize this. Um, uh, you know, the saying that the four most dangerous words in investing are, I, um, are this time is different. The three most dangerous words in investing are, I missed it. And uh, Glenn came up with a very clever one. The two most dangerous words in investing are, Charlie's wrong. Uh, uh, he almost never is. Uh, he gave me some great personal uh, advice. And uh, one of my great regrets is, is that I wasn't smart enough to listen to him until uh, it was too late. So we have um, one last question. Great. So uh, while you're answering this, maybe if there are others, uh, put them in. Otherwise, um, this will be the last one. Is it true that if you short a stock and it goes to zero, you don't have to buy back the shares, i.e. no further action is required? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and it's one that's, uh, that turns out to be surprisingly complex because you would think uh, you short a stock at $10 and you're, it's the perfect short. The company goes bankrupt. Um, the, the, the stock uh, then trades on the pink sheets. The, stock, the company is eventually liquidated. 
um, and you think you're done, right? The obligation, the liability to buy back 10,000 shares of stock uh, is gone, um, but it turns out not so fast. Sometimes um, a couple things can happen that can really cause you a lot of trouble and why you have to buy back those shares. Go buy them back at a penny a share on the pink sheets, but buy back those shares before they stop trading because uh, a couple things can happen. Uh, one is, is um, uh, in bankruptcy, someone might come in um, and uh, use uh, go public uh, by taking those shares, getting rid of the liabilities, and that equity can come back and be worth something. Um, in some cases, uh, general growth properties went into bankruptcy. Bill Ackman stepped in, Bruce Berkowitz stepped in, bought the stock uh, well under a dollar a share. Um, and it turns out there was value for the equity. Um, and so that was one where we shorted it from 40 to one, then flipped around and went long it for one, from one back to 20. Uh, you do not wanna hang on to that short uh, as it rallies from one back to 20, uh, believe me. Um, but even if the stock never does come back out and never rallies, uh, if the stock stops trading, you now can't buy it back, uh, but your broker may come to you and say, hey, uh, we're going to start charging you very high fees uh, um, unless you buy the stock uh, and, and cover your position. And if you can't buy that stock back, your broker's really got you by the short hairs. Um, and I've heard horror stories uh, of, of, uh, uh, of people being charged huge amounts of money by their broker. And there's nothing they can do because they can't find the stock because it stopped trading a while ago. Um, and lastly, I'll tell you a situation that I'm currently stuck in right now, which is uh, we shorted Lehman Brothers as one of the great shorts of all time. We were shorted from 70 on down, but we shorted more at $17 a share seven days before it went bankrupt in September of uh, 2008. Um, and so it was the perfect short. This, the company went into bankruptcy. The, uh, uh, it was liquidated and the stock was, was uh, liquidated. The problem is, is in a very unusual twist in the bankruptcy, all the shares of Lehman Brothers were consolidated into one golden super share that's never gonna be worth anything. Um, it, um, um, it's subordinate to uh, something like 17 classes, uh, tranches of debt, all of which would have to get 100 cents on the dollar plus 10 years of accrued interest. So the stock uh, is never gonna be worth anything. But as I attempted to close my fund, um, uh, so when I closed it last September, uh, my prime broker uh, was insisting, uh, was saying that there's still a theoretical liability out there, and theoretically there is, um, and therefore they would not close out the position and they wouldn't allow me to return all my capital uh, to my shareholders, the 5% withhold awaiting the audit they were holding on to. Uh, finally, uh, after a lot of brain damage and a lot of effort, uh, we negotiated a settlement where I'm personally um, having to keep $2.50 a share against the 68,000 shares of Lehman uh, that we were short in the fund in order to return capital uh, to, uh, to my uh, investors. Uh, so that's uh, something like $170,000 um, that I personally in cash have to keep tied up uh, at uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, probably for another couple years, uh, which is how long it will take the bankruptcy to finally uh, be finished and, and that golden share to be uh, extinguished. Uh, so the simple advice here is, is don't be greedy uh, and hold out for the last fraction of a penny. Uh, don't be uh, too so averse to paying taxes, because obviously if you, as long as you don't buy back those shares, you don't have to pay the realized gains uh, on this wonderful short. Uh, you must, must, must buy back the shares at some point before they stop trading. And sometimes they stop trading, they, they go trading on the pink sheets um, and uh, they'll stop trading quite suddenly. So uh, don't be greedy, uh, cover that short position, pay the taxes, uh, declare victory and move on. So we have not received any other questions. So I think we... Uh, All right. Um, so look, just sort of parting words here. Um, if you're interested in short selling, uh, I hope I've sort of scared you into understanding that it's, it's super difficult, super dangerous. Um, much more so than on the long side. So you really, really, really need to know all the, all the landmines, uh, how to do this right. Um, and that's why we've created a special day dedicated solely to short selling uh, as sort of an optional fifth day on top of our three day lessons from the trenches boot camp and one day seminar on how to launch and build an investment fund. Uh, we just taught this for the first time a couple weeks ago. Uh, it was it was great, a um, uh, lot of interest, and we were able to impart a lot of knowledge. Um, we're happy to do so, you know, via this webinar. 
um, but trust me, we have only scratched the surface um, of what you need to know uh, to be a good short seller um, and make money, uh, And but more importantly, avoid the bombs. The key to short selling isn't finding stocks that go down. Uh, and that That's relative, that's hard, but much harder is, is avoiding the 10 or 20% of cases um, in which you just get clobbered. You got to avoid those landmines because uh, on the short side, your mistakes become a bigger percentage of your portfolio. Uh, whereas on the long side, your mistakes just get uh, dwindle to nothing. They, they don't affect you as they run against you. Whereas your shorts, your mistakes, uh, something like Tesla um, uh, can really crush you um, even if it's uh, only 10 or 20% of the time you're wrong. So. Um, that's the kind of stuff we teach. Uh, we've just uh, given a quick overview uh, on this webinar. Uh, so I hope you'll uh, join. Uh, uh, we're going to teach uh, this, uh, um, this uh, our short selling conference uh, next uh, September 24th. Um, and uh, then keep an eye on our calendar. Go to caselearning.com. And uh, it's got our schedule for, uh, for the next year, uh, both here in the United States. And uh, we're going around the world. And we're also going to be teaching uh, uh, starting on July 23rd teaching our entire program over the web via a webinar like this. So uh, go to our website, check it out, and uh, hope to see you in person at one of our events. Uh, thanks, and uh, Glenn and I are uh, signing out. Uh, take care and good evening.